Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Fern. Uh, it's del I'm delighted to be here this evening, uh, representing the Courtauld uh, in this tremendous collaboration with the V&A Dundee. Um, we started ResFest in 2017, and astonishingly, to me anyway, this is our fifth one. Um, and we've had uh, three in London, and uh, this time last year we were at the Ulster Museum in Belfast. And so it's really special for us to be able to uh, partner with the v and Dundee to be in this extraordinary, charismatic building and in this wonderful city. And I'm going to start by answering my question elliptically, why celebrate art history? Uh, by saying a little bit about the genesis of this event, which was really uh, intended to celebrate the discipline of art history in the broadest sense of the term. So anything that anybody says is art history for us is art history. Uh, it's a kind of magical incantation that you can say. Um, and uh, so my um, ambition uh, at the beginning of this talk is really to describe uh, the context for this coming into being. Um, the headquarters for the Courtauld Institute is at Somerset House in London and has been since uh, the late 1980s. And uh, we have embarked on a huge uh, transformative project which uh, has meant that our gallery is currently closed, our building, uh, our bit of Somerset House are shrouded in very elegant scaffolding uh, and uh, pictures of the Picture, some of the pictures in our collection, which are uh, currently not in the UK. In fact, they're, as you'll see in a second, on tour. And so this project is partly to revise this wonderful building, uh, which people have been complaining about since the 1780s as being marked by small lobbies, vertiginous stairs, inaccessible to people with, uh, who are incapable of climbing those stairs. And our project is partly about making the building accessible to more people and making it a nicer place to work, to study, to display our pictures. But that's not the only part of our project which is called Courtauld Connects. It's also about taking um, what is special about the Courtauld, which is certainly the collections that we have and partly the building that we're in, but it's mostly the people that make up the Courtauld community and the work that they do. And what I've been thinking about, or was thinking about back in 2016 16 when we cooked this up, was how can we take the magic of the Courtauld, which is an institution that's very focused on the history of art. We have 550 students, about 130 uh, uh, staff in total, of whom about 35 are our faculty. There are students study on mostly on art art history courses, but also on the conservation of wall paintings and easel paintings. And you'll be hearing from some of my colleagues and our former uh, students uh, later on in this event, uh, and also in curating. So my, my, my focus was, how do we take the wonderful things about the Courtauld, and this is our main entrance, and let the magic out of the Courtauld. Now, this is a slide that I get teased about a lot because um, one of my colleagues pointed out that it looked like evil coming out of the Courtauld. That is not my intention. It is meant to be the magic of art history coming out of our door um, and um, infecting, maybe not the right word, but uh, uh, imbuing the surrounding area with, uh, with the wonderful things that we do. And, um, and part of what we've been able to do while our galleries have been closed is, uh, is share our collections much more widely than we can normally. So we had a wonderful exhibition at the Fondation Louis Vuitton uh, earlier this year, um, uh, which attracted huge numbers of visitors uh, to their, their very charismatic buildings, some, I think, co common architectural themes. Um, and currently, uh, uh, many of our most famous pictures, including uh, Manet's Bar at the Folie Berger, are um, in Tokyo, and I absolutely love this photograph, um, partly because, you know, why can't we have uniforms that good? Uh, that may be part of our, our reopening, um, I don't know. But uh, there they are very carefully uh, hanging um, one of our most uh, celebrated pictures in Japan. And already, as a part of, of this touring collection, something like three quarters of a million people have uh, been able to see our pictures and engage a little bit with the history of our institution 
institution and the history of art that it represents, which is really exciting to us. But um, equally important, of course, isn't just, as I say, our pictures, but also what we do. And that is to contribute to the sum of knowledge um, about the history of art. And so ResFest came into being uh, with this kind of purpose in mind, to share advanced research in the history of art with the widest number of people uh, that we could reach. And I originally wanted to call it, I'm trying to remember, Fern will know exactly, I wanted to call it the Art History Research Circus. And Fern said that I wasn't allowed uh, because it sounded too silly, but in my heart, that is what it is, uh, the Art History Research uh, Circus. And, um, part, and here is uh, an event that we had, the last ResFest that we had uh, before our gallery closed. Um, and uh, as you'll hear in a minute, a really big part of our enterprise from the beginning has been to share not just um, uh, research in the academic sense, but also research that has resulted in creative outcomes as well, and especially poetry. At all of the ResFests that we've held, uh, new poetry commissioned to respond to works in our collection has been really a, the, like the kind of the beating heart of the whole enterprise. And here is one of the poets um, uh, speaking at uh, the ResFest that we held in 2018. So part of our purpose with all of this, not just ResFest and not just our touring collection, but the whole, the Courtauld as a whole, is to make the case that art history belongs to everybody. And by everybody, I mean everybody who has visited a gallery or a museum or a ruin to, ha to have their sandwiches maybe, or a stately home on a rainy day. Um, it's everyone who has got a tattoo inspired by the Lindisfarne Gospels or taken advantage of an Instagram opportunity that a museum has cunningly set up in order to trick you into having an Instagram opportunity and here's one that we have up in Tokyo right now with a, a fake living room where you can sit in front of our celebrated uh, Renoir La Loge. Um, it's uh, ev anyone who has carefully positioned a friend to make them look like they're holding up the levitated mass at LACMA and there's my friend Nick and I specifically took that photo because I wanted to get someone else in it who was also also taking the same photo. Everybody takes that photo. So that is potentially our audience. It's uh, people who engage with art that was made in the distant past and also in uh, the recent past. And uh, part of our perspective on this, I think, as an institution and certainly my own, is about the importance of art to human experience. Humans have been making art for just about as long as humans have been. Um, and I'm showing you here one of the amazing uh, wall paintings that is in Indonesia, in Sulawesi, uh, that's been dated, it's about 40,000 years old, something like that. Um, and for me, and I think for many people, it's a very evocative representation of the fact that human beings are art-making animals and image-making animals. Uh, and that the images that people have made over the long stretch of human history allow us to communicate with them kind of almost in a magical way across vast reaches of time and geography and religion and culture. Um, and art is uh, about uh, every corner of human experience too. Nature, religion, the inner life, power, creation, apocalypse, oppression, liberty, doubt, sex, fear, joy. I wrote down many, many words. I shall carry on reading my words that I thought about when I was uh, dr drafting this talk. Um, art describes the impossible, um, and it also reminds us, I think, of what is possible uh, it now and in the future. And one of the things that I think is uh, very, certainly very important to me in my thinking about the history of art is that artists are, amongst other things, themselves art historians. And in fact, Mike's talk just now, I think, made that point uh, very well, excavating a visual history of cartoons about uh, pierced sculptures. Artists are art historians uh, and very insightful ones as well, remixing the images of the past, rethinking them, subverting them and investing them with new meaning. And I'm showing you what I think is a, a world famous kind of iconic image of Beyonce and Jay-Z's apeshit video which set the world on fire in about 40 seconds when it dropped on the internet with their amazing takeover of the Louvre sparking controversy uh, and, and adulation I think in equal measure. 
And I think in, in their approach to the Louvre, they reactivated many images that have in some ways been dormant for us in the history of art. Icons of the Louvre and icons really of the long 18th and early 19th century perhaps, uh, or as in this case, uh, I can't remember the name of the artist, but um, this fam uh, that obviously was a joke, I'll get in trouble for that later, if I, uh, about to, in fact, controversially not included in the, uh, the um, massive exhibition that the Louvre has just mounted uh, of Leonardo. Um, and I think one of the fascinating things about this video uh, is that it's part of what the art newspaper dubbed the uh, Beyonce Delacroix effect, where uh, last year the Louvre smashed all of its visitor targets with 10.2 million people visiting, and that high visitor number was attributed uh, to Beyonce and to Delacroix in equal measure, attracting new audiences to the museum and encouraging people to think about it in a different way. So art history, I think, is something that isn't just pursued through books and through articles, lectures, exhibitions, research festivals like this one, televisual odysseys, but it's also something that's progressed by the making of new art through a creative engagement with the images, uh, with images and objects of the past. We live in a time of data. Uh, you don't need me to tell you that. We count everything that can be counted and we even count some things that can't be. And I've heard it said, uh, sometimes in very close quarters to the Courtauld Institute, that if it can't be measured, it doesn't exist. It was a very provocative statement. I'm pretty sure it's not true. I'm pretty sure that there are things that exist that can't be measured. Um, and there's, it's also true, I think, that you can measure some things, like this uh, poem by John Donne. It's 5.5 centimeters tall in my grandmother's university edition, which she, I think, acquired in 1933 when she was studying English at uh, Vassar University. So I can tell you that a statistic about this poem is that it's 5.5 centimeters, but it doesn't tell you anything about the poem, does it? And I think that that's one of the problems with the age of statistics that we're in. But one thing that can be counted and is counted in the world of the arts, of museums, of art galleries, is visitors. Uh, and it's a very important metric for us within the system and also for uh, our funders. Last year, there were almost 50 million visits to museums in the, in the English museums that are sponsored by the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. 830 visitors came to the V&A here in Dundee in its first year of opening, a pretty remarkable fact. In 2014, um, the, in a year when uh, there's a very, very good study about museum visits in Scotland, 27.65 uh, million visits to Scotland's museums and galleries could be counted. And uh, the inc economic impact that was uh, registered from that is a very impressive 891 million pounds. So those are some things that can be counted. But for me, the significant thing about those numbers, and especially the visitor statistics, isn't so much the fluctuations, the ups and the downs, the rises and the falls, the Im 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 impact of investment and so forth. For us, I think we should take heart from the fact that uh, so many people want to spend their time, their free time, their evenings, their afternoons, their lunch hours, their rainy time, their, ho their, their summer holidays, uh, experiencing works of art, historic architecture, uh, material culture of the past. That, I think, is something that is very much worth celebrating. That's one of my answers. We should celebrate art history because art matters to people a lot. Now, I'm going to finish by coming back to the question of poetry. As I've said, um, poetry has been an important part of ResFest ever since uh, we started it. And I'm delighted that that's true for this evening's event as well. And here is the poet Dean Atta, who at the time uh, of last ResFest in London, lived in London, and now has moved to Glasgow and has just written a, a very acclaimed uh, book called The... The flamingo, the, the, the noun flamingo, the black, the black flamingo, thank you, uh, which has got really wonderful reviews. Last year, the, uh, the poets as ever were commissioned to um, write a work inspired by something in our collection. And Dean chose our celebrated Cranach uh, painting of 
the temptation of Adam and Eve, the, where Eve, who's very saucy in this picture, uh, hands to a rather dim-looking Adam a luscious piece of fruit surrounded by wonderful animals. And in a very romantic and touching and playful poem, Dean proposed that we reimagine this, uh, this picture with two black boys in the Garden of Eden. And, uh, and so I think embodied this spirit of reinventing and remixing, drawing on the history of art. And so um, in, uh, it's striking to me, uh, really, that in this country there are something like 330 literary festivals every year, ranging from really tiny ones to whoppers like, um, like the Hay Literary Festival. And these festivals celebrate, as I'm sure you know, the connections between readers and writers, between local communities and the wider world, um, celebrating the importance of ideas, storytelling, reflection, and discussion. Art history could, I think, learn something from this massive literary enterprise. There is no art history festival, anything like this, not even one. But the audience, I think, is there and waiting and hidden in all of those statistics from the DCMS and Museums and Galleries Scotland. It's a good moment for it, too. Uh, we're in an image-saturated moment like none other in all of human history. Um, and uh, what we're doing tonight, celebrating images as a source of imagination, insight, elevation, empathy, wonder, laughter, and I think dissent as well. I want to end, really, with the, by zooming in to a detail of um, the picture that Dean uh, wrote his poem about. Um, which shows Eve reaching high and pulling the branch laden with the fruit of knowledge down towards her by saying that I am delighted to be here in Dundee to celebrate art history with all of you tonight uh, as a subject that has the power to invite everybody to take a closer look, to reach out like Eve is here, to examine the past and to see this moment that we're in with all of its difficulties in a bigger frame and to make more art. Uh, all of us should begin making more art instantly, whether it's poems or drawings or whatever. And also, as Eve suggests with her uh, wonderful hand here, to eat the fruit, eat the fruit of knowledge that is on the tree of art history. So thank you. <laughs>